please stay in class so you can win a prize. All right. Now, this morning we have an exceptional speaker. Some of you thought he was a double agent, a spy or something, because he's watching everybody as they come out up front. But no, he is a regular member here. John Novak. Stand up, please, John. Now, Novak, it's spelled N-O-W-A-K, so you'd think, hey, no whack. It's not true. The reason is this man, come on up closer, John. This man was born in Kaiserlautern, Germany, to missionary parents, a full-blooded German father and an American mother. They met at uh, Lipscomb. Okay. He was 10 years old when he came to the United States. A few months ago, he started speaking fluent English. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you heard that, yeah. Okay. Somehow, this man was able to convince the lovely, the saintly, the highly intelligent Terry Mays to marry him. Now she is Terry Mays Novak, uh, excuse me, Novak for 36 years, a married woman. Okay. Three kids, three grandchildren. Now John is the finance manager at Edwards Chevrolet. So you have anything to do with a car, this man is the man to see. Please help me welcome the man who came up with the immortal slogan, Bad credit, no credit, no problem. Help me welcome John Novak. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, it's kind of hard to, uh, I won't go anywhere. Uh, but no, no, I appreciate that. that. That was very nice and all. And uh, yes, as he said, been in the church for a long time. Seen a lot of ups and downs, a lot of changes, a lot, for good and bad both. Right? I mean, we've all been there. Uh, I noticed that we don't have all the women on one side of the building and the men on the other. I, I, I've been in those churches now. Some of you, I see you nodding. Uh, the, the doilies that normally were on grandma's table, you know, they're not on our heads uh, anymore. So, you know, there, there's been some things that have uh, changed and, and some for the better. I think for the better. We watch the church grow. This congregation is wonderful here. And so I started reading, and, and with uh, the lesson series that, that Brett's been going on, I thought encouraging words, what does that, what does that really mean? Because I love to be encouraged. I love seeing people come in here into the building, and you say hello, and you greet them. And most of the time, they've got a great smile on their face. They're so happy to be here. Other times you notice something, something's wrong, something's amiss in their life, something's going on. And you try to engage them in a little conversation and sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes there's a prayer off to the side. Sometimes there's a pat on the back, a hug, something like that. But has anybody in here, and, and we've got all ages, gone through life without an issue? Nobody? Okay. I figured there might be one perfect one in here, but, but we all go through these things, and we need encouragement from time to time, and we need to give encouragement from time to time. When I looked at the, the definition of encourage or encouragement, it, the one thing that kind of came out to me was giving hope. You're giving hope to people. And I thought, well... That's true. I, I think that's true. But I think there's another part of it. When I look at the word itself, encourage, is I think maybe sometimes we have to help these people become courageous in life. Because life takes courage. It's not easy. And it's not easy to know what to say to people and how to encourage them. You know, we do it with words. We do it with prayer. I'll pray for you. Anybody on Facebook in here? You know? You get, please pray, undisclosed reason, pray for me, right? And then others are, Brett talked today, he lost a family member uh, that they're uh, going to the, the funeral, I believe, tomorrow. And so, you know, we want to say these prayers, and they do mean a lot. But another part of that is our actions. We pray, but what are our actions behind it? And in Galatians uh, 6, 2, it talks about bearing one another's burden. And sometimes that's easy to do. Sometimes that's very difficult to do. And how do we do it? You know, you know what, what do we do? Well, number one, we have to get involved. What do we have here? Love, 
connect, serve. Well, love is there. I see that every time I step in this building. The connection is there too, but how connected are we? How many times do we get very close, go out to dinner, go to lunch, sit down and talk, meet at work, uh, you know, whatever it takes, how close could we become to one another? And in that connection, we begin to get on a personal level with people. And a personal level is part of getting close to people maybe we don't know. They're not in our social group. They're not our age. They're not in our socioeconomic level. But we need to get close to these people. Just as Christ, is he close to you? And we're supposed to be Christ-like, so we're going to get close to these people. But you have to realize there's some results from this. And some of these results sometimes are not good, at least the, what happens. And the results are, number one, is hurt. If you have any family whatsoever, parents, children, spouse, grandma, granddad, anybody, you've been hurt. Somebody in your family has hurt you before. But they could only hurt you because you were close to them. You knew certain things about them that meant something. Y'all had a connection. And it was close, and so you got hurt by this. All right? There's frustration. You know, you ever do this? If they would just do this, I've told them 10 times how to do it, and I'm frustrated. And they keep getting in trouble. They keep failing. They keep having this issue going on, and I'm frustrated by it. Pain. We're hurt because sometimes we don't talk to a family member for years, years at a time. And often we just haven't reached out. We haven't reconnected to these people. But then there's joy. Isn't it wonderful when you mentor someone and you encourage them and you see them blossom and they grow as a person and they spread their wings and you know I heard talking about uh, I'll fly away what a great song and they get this freedom and the great joy you have watching somebody that you've mentored and we can all think of those people we've done that to it gives us a deeper faith in God because maybe he gave us the tools he opened our eyes to what the possibilities actually were with this person and it's exciting and we're so close to God at that point and we're so grateful, and we, we say the prayers of thankfulness that God gave us this opportunity to do this. But we have to look for the opportunities. What is Matthew 28, the Great Commission? What's the first part of that? Go. Go ye where? All the world. That's part of it. It's an action statement. Go ye into all the world. People we know, we can encourage because we know them. We know how they act. We know their movements. We know their personalities. What about people we don't know? Part of my job, and my job is, remember when you buy that car and you go in to sign the contract and that guy says, oh, by the way, you need this snake oil and you need this and a warranty. There you go. That's what I do when people... Uh, uh, want to get financing, that's what I do. So I get to talk to a lot of these people and, and show opportunities, and you have to learn people fast. So there's a certain connection I've had with customers for 30-plus years I've been in the business. They're kids, and this makes you old, is when their grandkids come in and say, my granddaddy bought a car from you back in... <laughs> Stop, you know, <laughs> please don't say that. Uh, so... But that's a great connection that I love with the customers I have. And it's a trust, isn't it? They trust me now to give me money for something. Now, just think if you have that same trust with everybody in this congregation, that they are willing to give you riches from their heart, troubles from their heart, and you're going to help them move forward. What a great trust. That's what God tells us to do, right? Turn our troubles to him. So we start looking at, well, where do I look for these? Let's start thinking about it. And you have to start making a list for yourself outside of what you normally do. And that's part of that change where we're sitting together. 
instead of separate, okay? That's part of the change we start thinking about. How about people that continually ask for prayers? And I'm going to give a couple of quick examples here, and that is in going to church, a friend of mine, his mom, it seemed like every other Sunday she was going forward asking for prayers, right? And after a while, sadly, and, you know, to, to our error, we would say, well, I wonder what it is this time. I wonder what's going on in their life again. Here they go. Over the years, as I grew older and matured, hopefully, I began to see her more and more and talk with her. She was highly respected in her job that she worked at Veterans Hospital, VA Hospital. Highly respected for what she did. And as we talked, learned that she had left the church. Now, she still believed, and she met with a small group in her home or other homes to study God's Word, but as far as this type of setting, she had left. And in talking with her, I said, I've, I've got to ask, what was going on in your life? She said, well, my husband abused me. He ran around on me. He spent all of our money. He drank too much. She was suffering every day of her life. And I wasn't connected enough to see it. I can blame it on youth. Didn't know, didn't care. All, should have recognized that. Should have known it. One of the members here, he and I have talked about, about this lesson and because uh, we both grew up in the church. We're the same age. And so, you know, we like his father is a minister as well. And we were talking and he told me, he said, yeah, I got to tell you a story too. Gentleman was always going forward in his church. This was up north Alabama. And kind of the same thinking process. He said, I found out years later, he was alcoholic and fought every day to control his alcoholism. That's a problem, isn't it? That's an intervention sometimes we need to do to be so close to these people, so close to us, that maybe we get a phone call every day or every week. What's going on? Why don't you come over? If you're struggling, I'm here day or night. You pick up the phone and call. How about people who have lost jobs? We had any of that in the congregation? We've, people who have lost jobs, all right? I'll pray for a job to open up for you. Now, I tell you what, I'm not just gonna pray. You got a resume? You don't know how to write one? I'm gonna find somebody who can write one for you. And then we're gonna find a job for you. How about somebody here in the congregation who has a business? Why don't you hire these people? Well, you know, if they don't work out, make it work out. If it doesn't work out, find them another job. I had a manager as I grew in the business I'm in. You go from sales into one department this, and I became a manager and, and the car business. Is anybody in the car business in here? And it may be like your business, but it's cutthroat. No matter what, you could have been at a job 10 years, been productive for 10 years. You have one bad month, they fire you. That's just the life. I love the challenge, love the excitement. It drives my wife crazy, but that's okay, you know. But that's just part of the business. But he told me, he said, if you're going to let somebody not go, remember it's your fault because you hired the wrong person or you didn't train them properly. So that means before you let them go, you find them a job or find them an interview. And so that's what I started doing. So before I let, because not everybody fits in the square hole or the round hole. So I started finding jobs for people. It's not easy. And sometimes you push. And good friends say, if it doesn't work out, I'll have to fire them. I said, then find them another job. Train them. What are you talking about? These are human beings. These are people. Train, motivate, encourage. That's what it takes. I think about the homeless. We have Thursday night, we feed the homeless. Have you been out there? You gotta go. Um, where I work, there is a homeless shelter just right next door. And a lot of these people, and, 
And I've heard it, you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I like to work, been mowing lawns at 13, 14, and worked ever since. You know, they just need to pull their bootstraps up and get to work. There's a lot of mental illness in homeless people. There is a lot. And I don't understand it. I grapple with it. And, and you help and you help, and it goes along good, and then it drops off. And it goes along good, and it drops off. But this is the reality of society. It's always been there, always will be. In this congregation, I'm sure there are people that are struggling with mental illness right now. And they just don't need prayers. They need action with those prayers, that we're there. There's addiction, drug addiction, you know, alcohol addiction, gambling addictions. There are these things that go on. We have to connect. And then we serve them. And sometimes it's us that needs to be served, right? It's, it's hard going through life and never needing help because it always happens. So, you know, we need to support the young. We're taught that the men should train the, the young men, the women train the young women. That's part of it. Have we adopted? We're, is there anybody 18 years old or younger in here? Um, we, we need to... We need to adopt some of these young people that sit right over here. Find somebody you don't know. Learn about them and tell them, I'm here for you. Whatever you need, I'm going to be here for you. How about in your neighborhood? You know, find that. You know, there's a place to start. And one thing that's close to me are teachers. If I ask you right now, in your life, who's the most influential person? It's going to be mom, dad, grandparent, somebody who raised you that had a great influence on you. But I promise you this, the second one is going to be what? A teacher. These teachers, I know, spend out of their pocket every year money to make sure kids in their class have a great education. Find a teacher in your community and tell them, this year, I'm paying for every supply you need. It may be you don't go on vacation. It may be you don't go out to eat as much. Don't just hand them a check and say, great, love you, see ya. Call them every week. What do you need this week? What are you short of? Now we begin to encourage these teachers out there that struggle sometimes with so much craziness that goes on in a school system nowadays. And it helps. Years ago when I was in school, you never saw a child in a wheelchair in school. Because they didn't go to school, did they? They stayed home. And somebody kept them. Nowadays, the great thing is there are special education teachers. There are special needs teachers that these kids now can have as normal of a life as possible. So what can we do with those families? We could babysit one night. We could learn about it. We could see what it takes. We could connect with them and ask them. Because these parents, this is not a, hey, we're going to be in trouble for a month, and then we're going to be OK. It's lifelong. It's a lifelong commitment. These are things that we begin to really connect and get with our church family and our families and the uh, community around us. Um, you know, it's not, all, it's not always easy. It's rarely easy. And we don't always know what to say. And I'm going to give you a, an example if I can work this properly. Uh, the picture here, the young lady in the middle is named Abby. And she worked with me out at the Mercedes store for a few years, and she did the same job I did. I trained her, and that's her son and daughter with her. Uh, that's Harrison and Lauren. And they're about, each one is about 15. I think Lauren's 19 in that picture right there. And every morning, and you have these people at work. You know these people. Every morning, she'd walk by my office and say, good morning, sunshine. 
you know. Most mornings it was fine. You know, most mornings, good morning, Abby. How you doing? You know, she was bubbly, you know, to a fault bubbly. Every morning, morning sunshine, morning sunshine, morning. But after a while I said, you know what, that's Abby. And she's crazy. And I love her. And we became close. You ever meet those people you just connect with and you go, I think we knew each other in another life because we're so close. And I loved Abby, loved her to death. Well, back a little over a year and a half ago, she came to me and she said, uh, something's wrong, I gotta, gotta go to the doctor. I said, well, go, please. I uh, got some news, you may be doing deals by yourself for a while. I thought, what are you talking about? She says, well, I've, I've got cervical cancer. And I said, okay. What are we going to do? She says, ah, don't worry about it. You know, I'm going to the doctors. I'm doing this. Never, never was down. Well, it just progressed so badly. Lungs, you know, breast. She, can't, she called me one time, and she said, you know, John, I'm in Atlanta. I've been through so much that, and let's see if I can get this. That's her right there. She says, I've been through so much. She says, I'm not giving up. I'm fighting this. She says, you and I are going to be a team again. And I said, well, I'm ready for that. And she said, you know what? She said, they found a cancer in me that I can't even pronounce. I'm like a case study. She says, this is pretty exciting. <laughs> I'm thinking, Abby, you know, I'm over here in tears, you know, because this best friend of mine is suffering. Well, back New Year's of uh, last year, New Year's Day, I call over. Hospice is at, at her house. And I call over, talk to her mom, and I say, hey, I'm, I need to come visit Abby. And, and she says, well, she's kind of in and out, but, uh, you know, come on over. And then I hear her in the background, who is it? It's John. Where has he been? Come over. So I said, oh, I'm coming over, Okay. So I went over and, and uh, she was able to talk for about an hour with me, sat there and held hands. And sometimes at one in the morning, and of course my daughter Katie is at Jacksonville State, so my phone's on 24 seven. Sometimes I see it light up, see something. There on Facebook is Amy, Think, thinking of KB. These are sad stories, but they're life stories. And we all have them. And we've all experienced them. And Amy is going to need us for the rest of her life. It never ends. If she came forward every day, every Sunday, called us and said, I need your prayers, we need to be there. And the thing is, we're going to be Christ like. What does Christ tell us? Matthew 28. What does he tell us there before he ascends into heaven? And lo, I am with you always, even, even till the end of time. You see, so anything we go through, Christ is with us always. He never leaves us. He's there. Now, sometimes we step away, don't we? He doesn't let us get too far. He, he'll pull us back. But he's always there encouraging. But who else? Who does he use? What tools does Christ use to encourage? All of us. That's exactly right. And the great challenge is for us to do this. And sometimes we don't even know where to start. How do I, how do I start? I'm, it's, hard, you know, it's hard making friends with people, getting close, because what's one of the results that we get from making friends? You can say it. We get hurt, don't we? We get hurt by people. They hurt us. And I don't want to do that anymore. I'm tired of that. I don't want to do it. It doesn't matter. Up to the point of giving our lives is what's asked of us as Christians to go that far. So the pain that we have from that person is minimal to what we can encourage them with. 
you know, in uh, the King James Version, James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's a starting point if you're unsure. Find somebody who has nothing and bring something to them. And it may be it's a one-time bringing to them. It may be a lifetime of bringing to them. Anybody have children in here? Anyway, is there a point we kind of say, you're on your own, please don't come over anymore, I really don't want to see you, I still remember that diaper back, you know, 35 years ago, oh, whew, that was a bad one, um, you know, I'm not going to deal with it, we don't do it, it's a lifetime commitment from us, even when they make us mad, even when they leave us, right, sometimes they leave us and don't talk to us for a while. But we never leave them just as Christ never leaves us. Same thing. So we encourage there. I like reading different translations of Scripture because sometimes it brings more out. In the uh, Phillips translation, it says, religion that is pure and genuine. I like that word. Religion that is pure and genuine in the sight of God the Father will show itself by such things as visiting orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself uncontaminated by the world. I love that translation where he says it sh our Christianity will show itself by doing these things. I'm not worried what goes, in the goes on in the world. I think about it. I see it. I really don't care who's president. I vote because we are in this great land where we can do it. I do vote, but I don't care who's in there because no matter who's in there, I'm going to be a Christian, and I'm going to show that to the world, and I'm going to go to the point where people say, why are you doing that? It's because I say, because I love you, and because Christ did it for me first. That's why I do it, and it's important to do it, and it goes on. So we begin to see this in a different light, and we see the world. We don't have any problems as Christians. In James... We read part of it, but that chapter, read the whole book, he talks about how our attitude should be. I'm closing. I know you're coming up here. Um, don't ever give a preacher's son and a salesman a microphone. <laughs> First rule. But um, we don't have any issues or problems, okay? And this is a thinking change for you. Don't say, I've got a problem here. There's an issue over here. I want you to start changing that word out and say, we have an opportunity over here. We have an opportunity over here. This is going on, and here is a Christian's opportunity to show Christ and Christ-like in the world. And we're going to go ye into all the world. We're going to go find these opportunities that other people are calling problems. We're going to find them. And then we're going to make the changes. And we're going to adjust. And we're going to be hurt and feel joy and feel all the emotions that Christ felt when he came to this world. All right? This is the challenge we're going to do. We're going to find these things. And start calling each other. Because I have a feeling y'all call each other in this group anyway. Call each other and say, you know what? I found out that, that one of the young couples is struggling with this. What's the opportunity to move with them? What can we do? There's somebody maybe older that is struggling with this, some depression, some loneliness. What are we going to do with this opportunity to show our Christianity? And that's the difference we'll make. And when you walk away, you're going to be so much closer to God, and he's going to begin to reveal his word in ways you can never imagine. And it's such a blessing to us. And when we meet our maker, we'll be that much, we already know what to expect because we've already been there on earth. We've brought God to people. Let's be encouraging this week. And that's all.